change, nothing will change. And I was one of those kids who made a lot of excuses. We know students like that? Sometimes, we, yeah, we do. And I remember him telling me that life was all about choice. You could choose to win or you could choose to lose, but you could not do both. And at that moment, I said, you know what, whatever. And I just, I, I, I got released and I just, for the next couple years, I kept on doing crazy stuff. And I remember in 1986, I turned 18. And life was at an all-time dead end for me. Nothing was going right. I was involved in a gang, and my dad had now developed cancer. And I'm a kid who's out of control. I'm a kid who they said couldn't make it. But still, even at that point in my life, there's a little voice in my mind of someone telling me that I could, that voice of the third grade teacher, that hero, that people thought was insignificant, the teacher who didn't make a lot of money, the teacher who was told that what she did was not going to matter because kids like us could not be reached and we could not be taught. But yet she did it anyway. And I remember standing there and making a very critical decision. I said, you know what? I'm done. So I remember scripting out my suicide. And I remember standing there with a 9 millimeter gun in my hand. And I'm standing there with this gun in my hand wanting to end it all. And I remember putting this gun to my head, and I, I'm trying to pull the trigger of this 9 millimeter, but it seemed like my finger wouldn't move because every time I would put the gun to my head, there's a voice of this teacher telling me that I could make it. She, could tell, she told me that I could do it, that one day that I would be significant for me to keep my chin up, and I am frantic. I'm pacing back and forth. I've got this gun, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how, I'm trying to pull this trigger, but I can't because there's this voice in my head telling me that I could be somebody. And I remember I'm pacing back and forth, and I remember stopping and taking a couple deep breaths, and I remember saying, this time, I'm going to do it. So I take this gun, I take a deep breath, and I'm crying, and the tears are coming out of my eyes, and they're hitting the floor. And I take this gun, and I put it to my head, and I close my eyes, and I squeeze the trigger, and the trigger's halfway, almost, and my telephone rings. I'm like, God, I am a loser, you know? And so... I'm, I'm like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, God, I can't even kill myself right. And I'm frustrated. I'm like, oh, my God, what type of loser am I? You know what I mean? And I remember a voice saying, answer the phone. So I went over, and I picked up the phone, and it was a good friend of mine named Reggie Hines. See, Reggie Hines and I had grown up together in the same inner city neighborhood, and his father wasn't in his life, and we had both kind of dropped out of school, and now Reggie had turned 18 just like me, but now Reggie had turned his life around. And Reggie's going off to the army to study medicine. And I was devastated. I was jealous because my best friend is leaving me. And I said to Reggie, I said, man, it's done. It's over. He says, dude, what are you talking about? And I says, man, I, I don't know. I got this gun. I got this gun. I, I'm going to do it. It's over. I can't take it. He says, Mark, don't do anything. Just stay where you are. I'll be over in five minutes. He hangs up the phone, and I'm standing there with this gun, pacing back and forth. And I remember... About five minutes, I hear his car pull up, and I'm thinking that my friend is coming to save me. I think he's coming to tell me, Mark, please, don't do it. I want you to live. But my friend didn't do that. You know what he did? He walks up my steps, and he walks into my room, and he says, so this is the way it's going to end? This is what you're going to do? This is the choice you're going to make to end your life? And he was livid. And he says, you know what? That's great. Not a problem. Go ahead and do it. End it. It's your choice. But remember this. In a matter of a month, nobody will even remember your name. It will be as if you never existed. He said, think about that. He turns around, walks down my steps, gets in his car, and he takes off. My best friend. And I'm standing there with this gun in my hand. And I remember, all of a sudden, this poem comes to me by Robert Frost that says, Somewhere ages, ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I chose the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And then all of a sudden, I, I became conscious of my heartbeat. I became conscious of my breath, inhaling and exhaling. And I said to myself that, you know what? If I can focus on breathing, 
If I can focus on just living every day, just inhaling and exhaling, I'm good. And then a voice in my mind comes back, Miss Ritchie, who says, once again, you are significant. And I put down the gun, and in 1986, I began to live as opposed to exist. Not because I'm anything special, only because there was a teacher who told me that I could. A teacher who told me, this young black kid that nobody wanted, that nobody believed in, that nobody thought could do anything. The same black kid that people thought would end up in jail and have 20 babies all over the country and do all types of crazy stuff and become another statistic. This teacher said, you will not fail, you will win. And I continued to inhale and exhale because of what she did. And I'm going to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, from 18 until about 20-something, life was rough. I tell you, it was not easy. But you know what? I did it anyway. See, greatness, it's not about the big, grand things. Greatness is about pushing forward when you don't want to. It's about doing the stuff that you don't want to do even when it's hard. And I know that it's rough. The educational system right now in this country, it is, it is rough. All the teacher bashing that's going on, all the people that are talking about you and that you're not doing a good job and the budget cuts, they're asking you to do more with less. It's not easy. It is rough. It is hard. But you know what? We need you anyway. Because there's some kid in your classroom, some kid you've affected or some kid that you may affect that needs what it is you have. Every one of you has your own DNA, your own special fingerprint, your own uniqueness, or as Austin Power said, your own mojo, your own way of doing things that nobody else can do but you. Whether you're a classroom teacher, whether you're a secretary, it doesn't matter. If you're in education, you have the power to change somebody's life. And that's the, the biggest part of greatness that I think that we can understand as it relates to education. Some of you have thought about, at some point, giving up. Anybody ever thought about giving up? About quitting? Anybody ever said, said you were going to quit at least once? Absolutely. You, I mean, you have this great speech. It's over. It's done. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going to go work at Walmart. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not going to teach anymore. I, I'm just, I, I'm not going to do it. It's over. These kids are just too much. It's not going to happen. I'm done. And you swear to yourself. You go and you talk to your colleagues. You know what? This kid, Randall, he's been on my nerves I mean, this kid comes in, he sleeps all the time. I mean, he does all this stuff, and you swear to your colleagues that it's over. You're done. You're out of here. And what do you do? You go home, you look at your mortgage statement. Ah, I can't do it. You know, that's what happens. Jeez, I had bills to pay. Come on. And the thing about it is, excuse me, I'm going to get some water. The thing about it is you begin to remember why it is you got into this profession in the first place. You begin to remember your calling, your uniqueness, what made you different, what made you come into education. And it's not always about the money because, personally, I'll tell you this. I don't think teachers are paid enough, honestly. For what it is, someone said, hey, man, right? No, seriously, for what it is you do, you're not paid enough. You should be paid at least 100 grand, at least, for what it is you do. Maybe we can put that on the petition for next year. I don't know. But, you know, hey, look. <laughs> God, thank you so much. The thing about it is, is why do you do this? Why did you become a teacher? You guys remember when you first decided to become a teacher? You guys remember that? How many people remember? Okay, we need some ginkgo below, but that's okay. Fantastic. None, nonetheless. But you remember I was in a school district once, and I asked a teacher. I said, um, she was brand new. She was like 24 years old. She's brand new into the profession. And I was interviewing some teachers, and I said, look, can you tell me, you know, why did you become a teacher? And she was one of these what I call bubbly people. Anybody know the bubbly? We, we call them sunshine people. Anybody know sunshine people? These are the people that are optimistic no matter what happens. There could be a tsunami coming, and they're like, well, hey, you know what? Let me get a surfboard. It's okay. <laughs> Everything's going to be great. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're just so passionate and so energetic. And so I'm talking to this teacher, and I said, ma'am, I said, why did you become a teacher? She's 24. And she says, well, um, I became a teacher because, like, when I was a kid, I was babysitting. And I, just, I was just really good with kids, and so I just really wanted to make a difference. And, like, many kids would go out and pick flowers. And so I thought that maybe I could be a teacher. And, I mean, so she went on and on and on and on, right? And the thing about it was, about a year and a half later, I go back to the district, and she had lost her enthusiasm. 
It wasn't the same. I saw her, I said, hey, how's it going? How's the teaching going? Man, are you still excited? She's like, uh. I mean, you know, that, that was it. This, uh, from all oh, greatest great to, uh, what, I mean, how does that happen, you know? And what I discovered was that when you give a lot of energy, if you don't replenish, if you don't constantly remind yourself why it is you do what you do, burnout can happen. Anybody ever been there? You ever been to the point where you just get up in the morning and you're just tired? You just feel you can't go on? But yet something happens in the course of teaching where you're reminded once again why you do what you do, why, you, why what you do is so important and so valued. And that's the most exciting thing about teaching. And see, the thing about it is, I remember that Miss Richie would come in every day and we would all stand in a circle and she would make us hold hands and she would tell every one of us how much she loved us and that we were significant and that we were special and she gave so much energy and I remember her passion for why it is she, she does what she did, why she, she continued to teach when they told her that she probably should stop because we weren't worth the time. But see, she believed in something bigger. She believed in something more. And when I look into this audience, I see just tremendous greatness. I see some of you who have reached kids in a way that you never thought that you would ever reach kids. You talk about the butterfly effect? How many, kids, how many of you have had some kids that were difficult? That because of what you've done, now they've changed just a little bit. They're not the same kids. See, that's what it's all about. And see, when we talk about the course of people in our life that make the biggest difference, we need to begin to realize that it's not just about what we do now. It's about 20 years from now, the impact that those kids that we serve today will make. See, it's all about paying it forward. It's all about the law of reciprocity that says that whatever you give, you're going to get back. See, I had a friend of mine who, many, many years ago when I was in college, I, I met this guy, and this guy was a professional speaker when I decided to get into the arena. And I'm at this event, and I meet this guy, and I tell him what I want to do. I want to make a difference for, for people's lives. And he stands up and gives me this book entitled Destined for Greatness. And he says, whatever you need, young man, I'm willing to help you. So for the next probably eight years, this guy mentors me and he encourages me. And he understands that if he sold into me, that maybe I could be the speaker that I've always dreamed of being. He never asked me for anything. He gave everything he had to me. And you know what? He... Sometimes I didn't even listen to him. And sometimes I'd make him upset. He'd tell me to do stuff. I wouldn't do it. I would learn by trial and error. But he never gave up. He inspired me to be greater. That whole butterfly effect. But see, if there was no much Richie, there would never be other mentors. There would never have been this guy. And this guy, I have to just tell him how much I appreciate him and show my love for him. And that is one of your own, Dr. Robert Lawson. Stand up for me, sir. Yes, sir, you, sir. Please stand up. Now, let me tell you something about Doc Lawson here. Doc Lawson plays the guitar, grew up in Gallipolis, Ohio, lived down in Port Smith. And I tell you, there were many times when I was going through my career that I, I didn't think that I was going to make it, but he, I would go down to his house and we would sit on his front porch. And what he would do, he would paint this picture of what could happen. He would paint this picture of what I could become. And the thing about it was, see, we all need someone in our life that believes in us. See, when we begin to look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that self-actualization piece, the one right at the tip, see, there's one but before that, it's the need to belong. Every kid, every person needs to belong to something. They need to feel valued. They need to feel like they're important. They need to feel that they're the most important thing because, see, the thing about it is, when kids don't believe that somebody believes in them, then they can never believe in, in themselves. Because, see, kids never really do what we say, but they always do what we do. Kids are smart these days. They're a lot smarter than when I was a kid. And kids understand that they're looking for great mentors. They're looking for people who think outside the box. They're looking for someone who really believes in this aspect of teaching. And every day when you go to work and you look in the mirror at yourselves, you need to be proud about what you do. You need to understand that you are the greatest resource this nation has because most of our kids spend more time with us than they do at home. And when they're in our classroom, they belong to you. They are your family. They are looking to you 
for inspiration. And that's why it's so important for us as heroes to understand energy, to understand the importance of supporting one another, helping your colleagues, because I'm going to tell you, sometimes in this profession, you want to burn out. You want to just give up. You must change the way you think. See, the thing about it is there are a lot of people out here who say that education doesn't work. There are a lot of people out here who say that what you do is just not working, but I say different. You know why? Because I'm here. I'm still standing. I'm still resilient because of you, because you believed in me, because you told me that I could. And though you did not indirectly influence me, still, I am a result. I am the byproduct of what you do. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a guy for fanfare. Trust me, I'm nothing special, but I am honored. And I know that each and every one of you has a special gift. And I know that what you do makes a difference. See, because of Miss Ritchie and what she did for me in 1977, when I turned 18, I began to attract other mentors. And I remember getting hired by this organization called the Civilian Conservation Corps. And I remember becoming an actor, and I met Malcolm Jamal Warner from The Cosby Show, and I did all this stuff, and I used to write plays, and I thought I was going to be the next Sidney Poitier. But of course, it didn't happen. I wasn't as good looking as that guy, and I definitely wasn't as skilled. But I went through trial and error, and I tried different things, and I got involved in this environmental program where they would take a bunch of kids, and they would put us out in the middle of nowhere and teach us how to run heavy equipment and chainsaws and all this stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, why me? Why... I can't do this stuff. I'm, 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 you know, I'm black. Uh, no, seriously, I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm black, and my uncle, and I'm just being very honest. You know, I'm just telling you. I was talking to my uncle, and I said, you know, they got me out here in the woods and stuff, and I'm scared, and I mean, you know, and my uncle, who you get, anyone, everyone have a crazy uncle or a crazy relative that just says stuff that's like out of the out of the box. My uncle tells me, he says, well, boy, you know, uh, he says, man, uh, he says, the only black man I know in the woods is Smokey the Bear. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what? Are you, are, you, are you kidding me? He was dead serious. I'm like, wow, thank you so much. Thank you for building my self-esteem, uncle, you know. And so my dad was like, don't listen to him. He's crazy. He was. And I remember working in the environment, and I remember building stuff with my hands, and I remember that when I would go out, I would ask myself, how did I get here? And I remember that voice of a third grade teacher telling me that I was significant, that I can make it. And I remember going out to California. I got selected to go out to California. On the picture, you saw me in the mountains. I was working for a backcountry trail crew doing trail construction for the U.S. Forest Service, 13 miles into the backcountry. We were there for six months. That picture, I'm at the top of Mount Whitney, 14,677 feet. And the thing about it was, when I got to the top of that mountain, I'm standing there, and clouds are in my face. And I stood there, and I remember asking myself, how did I get here? It was that whole butterfly effect. It was that one teacher who decided she was going to fight the school system who says, we will serve these children. And the school system told her no. She says, I want to help these kids. They told her no. She says, I will sue you. They told her yes. <laughs> and that teacher who was given 12 kids that they said couldn't make it, she says, if you don't want them, I'll take them. Let them come to me. And I'm sitting on the top of this mountain, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm crying, and I'm saying, how does that happen? It happens through a thing called magic. It happens through a thing called life. It happens through a thing when people believe in something bigger than themselves, and they have energy within their heart to make it happen. Impossible things begin to transpire. A $500,000 grant? They just don't give those things away to, to just every school district. But somehow, you guys got that grant, right? You know why? Because you're out of the box thinkers, you're different. You have something unique, you have something special. When I came here the first time last year, it was so amazing because I walk in here and it wasn't as many teachers as it is now, but the energy was off the chain. It was just out of control and then I went and I met with some supervisors a couple months ago and the energy was just contagious and here I am and the energy is just phenomenal. There I am on the top of a mountain saying, you know what, maybe it is possible. And I remember getting off that mountain, coming down the trail, and I finished my time, and I remember going back home to Dayton, Ohio, back to the Conservation Corps, and I got my last promotion, and it was my time to leave. It was an 18-month program. They had given me a six-month extension. I, they added that on to that, and of course, now my time is over. But guess what? 
I don't have a high school education. You know why? I'm a ninth grade high school dropout. I can't succeed. And I became very depressed and very devastated because of that. But then again, in my mind, there's a voice saying, keep your chin up, keep moving, you're significant. I went to my camp director and I said, sir, I says, I don't think I can make it out there alone. I don't think I can, I can do this. He says, what are you talking about? I said, sir, I got a ninth grade education. They said, Mark, you've changed your life. You've beaten everything that's beaten you. What do you choose to do? I said, sir, I want to win. He, he says, then why don't you? I says, I'm a ninth grade high school dropout. I, I'm not really good with math, and I, I really can't do this. And he says, Mark, shut up. He says, don't you ever tell me what you can't do. He says, you've beaten drugs. You've beaten the gangs. You've beaten everything. You're here. You went through this program with flying colors. He says, I tell you what. He says, you need to go to college, sir. I said, college? Sir, I, I'm not going to no college. I, I'm not college material. See, nobody in my family except for my older sister went to college. I, I'm not college material, sir. And once again, he says, Mark, shut up. He says, what do you mean you're not college material? I said, sir, I have a ninth grade education. He said, I tell you what. If I get you into college and you do everything you can do, I'll do everything you can do. You know, if you get into college, that you can get a GED while you're there. And if you finish college, sir, and you work hard, that they'll give you this thing called a degree. Do you realize that? I said, no, sir, I didn't. He says, you want to go? I says, I don't have any money, sir. He says, how much does your dad make? He said, probably about $565 a month, retirement and Social Security combined. He says, you qualify for full financial aid, sir. We'll see if we can get you some hardship scholarships. He says, we're going to get you in college. And if we go to college, what do you want to take? I said, I want to do this environmental thing. He says, done. Two days later, he calls me into his office. He says, Garrett. Just get in here. He says, in three months, you're going to go down. You're going to tour college. We're going to get you in college, sir. You're going to be a winner in life. I said, thank you, sir. He says, um, be here at a certain such a time, blah, 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 blah. And um, he says, this college is great. It is phenomenal college. It, it is, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those colleges that's world-renowned. And you're going, to be, you're going to do great there, sir. The town that I'm going to send you to, oh, my God, you're going to love it. It's a big metropolis. It is going to be fantastic for you. And I'm thinking, great, maybe I'm going to California. Maybe they're going to send me to Chicago. They send me down to a place called Nelsonville, Ohio. <laughs> now, you, you got to understand something here, folks. If you've ever seen Mayberry or the Andy Griffin show, that's kind of like how Nelsonville was. And, and here's the funny thing. They send me down to tour this college during hunting season. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, um, that's not something that people in my neighborhood did. We didn't hunt anything. Now, when it came Easter time, we would hunt Easter eggs, you know, and stuff like that, but we would not hunt. So I'm on this bus, and I'm going from Dayton, Ohio, to Nelsonville, Ohio, during hunting season. And when you talk about culture shock, it was, um, should I say, very different. Um, I, I had never seen shotguns and windows and pickup trucks. I, I had never seen that. I, I had never seen people dressed in pumpkin orange with numbers on their back. I'm thinking they're escaped convicts. Um, yeah, I had never seen blood and dead animals with their tongues out and stuff like that. I, I had never seen stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me, right? And so we get down to um, Nelsonville, Ohio, and we stop at this little convenience store right on the corner, and I go in, and the music is a little different than what I'm used to. Music has a little twang to it, and um, people, they talk a little different down there. And this guy behind the counter, he says, uh, he says uh, welcome to Nelsonville. He says, man, let me ask you a question. He says, um, you're not from around here, are you? And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going on? And um, I, I'm just standing there. I'm like, no, sir. He says, well, how do you? And I'm just standing there, and he kind of looks at me, and he says, well, how do you? And in my mind, I'm thinking, how do you do what? What are you, what are you asking me to do, right? And so the guy standing next to him, he looks. He says, hey, ma'am. He says, this boy right here ain't from around. He says, son, let me tell you something. He says, down here in these parts, when a man says, how do you? You just say how do back. And I was like, well, how do, right? So I'm how doing everybody. And I go to the college, right? And I get off the bus, and there's like interpretive services and forestry. And somehow I end up in the wildlife biology group. 
fish and wildlife management, right? And so guy gets off, we get off the bus, and the guy says, hey, he says, everybody going to fish and wildlife, wildlife here, blah, 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 it was all this commotion, and I'm, I ended up with the wildlife guys. So they take us on this tour, and they take us into this room called taxidermy. And um, I, I'm in this room, and I'm, I'm really freaked out because there's like these animals that are frozen in time, you know, and there's all these heads on the wall, and they're all looking at me, and I'm just like, oh, my God, is that Bullwinkle? You know, I, I didn't know. Well, I was like, how Bullwinkle? My, what did they do to you? I'm scared to death, right? And so um, I do the tour, and the guy says, well, son, what major do you want to declare? You want wildlife? You want this? I said, oh, yeah, wildlife. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, because I had planned to never come back. I, I was like, yeah, yeah, wildlife, great. He says, great, what's your name, Gary, social security number? So I go back home, and um, I go to back to my camp manager, and I said, sir, I said, I, I can't do this. He says, what do you mean you can't do this? I said, sir, um, th- there, there's, I, I just can't do this. And um, you guys remember The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis? Remember the, 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 the scene where the little boy says, he says, um, I see dead people? Well, in my mind, I was like, I don't see any black people. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm not, I'm not going back. I'm, I'm not going to do this. No, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. No, I'm not going. Never. So um, I go home. And my dad, who really had never been instrumental, he was my champion. He says, you know what? He says, son, sometimes in life you have to go to go where you want to go. Sometimes you got to go where you've never been. He says, you can't stay here, son. You got to move forward. You got to keep going. You got to keep moving. You can never stop. And then right at that instance, that voice in my mind comes back up. And Miss Richie, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go. And I left out with nothing. And I went down to a small town called Nelsonville, Ohio, and majored in fish and wildlife management. Bob remembers. And he would call me sometimes, how you doing? I'm like, I'm scared. Um, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it was, yeah, it was different. And, um, but you know what? I went down there, and what I found is that people are the same everywhere. That people have big hearts, and people really want you to succeed, and I had some of the best friends in my life and best times in my life at Hawken College, down in a small rural community that, I mean, <laughs> it, it wasn't much there. But guess what? I was still inhaling and exhaling, and I was becoming significant. And um, I got my GED while I was there, and I became a two-time academic All-American. I carried a 3.6 GPA. In fish and wildlife management, I became a dendrology instructor. You know what dendrology is? It's a study of trees. And I remember I, be, I, be, I became a tutor of dendrology, going out and looking at trees and scientific names and white oaks, black oaks, and red bud and all this stuff. I became engulfed in it all because a teacher in 1977 told me what was possible. How does that happen? whole butterfly effect, that teacher, she flapped her wings, and guess what? I became one of the top dendrology teachers, or, or tutors there. And then I got fascinated with this thing called fisheries and, and wildlife, and I used to work at a lot of deer checking stations. You know what my job was at the deer checking stations? I was aging deer by their teeth. I look at the teeth, oh, this is okay, juvenile, but, but whatever, you know, it was an amazing concept, and then I started traveling around the country doing wildlife. And the thing about it was, the South, Southeast Ohio, it spoiled me. I had never wore Carhartts in my life. I had never wore Rocky boots, and I'm wearing Carhartts and Rocky boots and steel chainsaw hats and, and all this stuff, and I'm going home, and then I got introduced to country music. Yeah. I got introduced to country music, and uh, I would go back home uh, playing Johnny Cash. And it wasn't anything fake, but I just became engulfed in the culture. And I would go home. Now, imagine a black guy going to the inner city playing Johnny Cash. Ah, that's not a good mix, right? You know, I'll walk the line. Uh, yeah, I better turn it off. You know what I mean? But I didn't care. I didn't care because I knew that if I could make it and make an impact, that's what life had for me. And I knew that maybe I could do something. Maybe I could mean something. Let me share this with you. At the end of our lives, it's not about the money we make. It's not about all the stuff that we try to acquire. 
the most important thing that we're going to ask ourselves at the end of our journey was, did I matter? Did I make a difference? Did I impact somebody's life? What did I give back? That's all that matters. That's all we're going to think about. It's not the money, Dr. Lawson. It's not the car we drive, Mr. McKibben. It's not a friend of mine, Chad. Kevin, it's not, it's not about that. It's about the essence of what we do with the time that we have here. That's what's important. You talk about the butterfly effect, because of what Miss Richie did for me and what people did for her, and because of all the stuff that all the people in my life, because of what she did, nobody else would have ever been able to impact me because if it wasn't for her, I never would have went to college. And I graduated college, and I decided to become a speaker and motivate teachers and kids all over the, the country, all over the world. And then they said, well, do you want to be a wildlife biologist? I said, well, I love it, but that's not what I want to do. But it was that journey that got me to this place. And they said, well, you got to go back to school and get another degree. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I went to a place called Ohio University, and I studied communication. I got a bachelor's and learned how to work with people. And I started taking a lot of speaking courses. I started doing volunteer work. This little black kid from the inner city that they said would never make it because of one teacher who told me what was possible. And because of that, I've spoken all over the country, all over the world, all throughout school systems, and hopefully impacted somebody's life. But it came to a point in my life, even as a speaker, that I thought that I didn't have value. Just like sometimes in what it is you do, you feel you don't have value. You never know who you're impacting. You never know who you're touching. The very kid that you think is not looking at you, is not watching you, they're watching everything you do. And it's not about right now where you're going to...